If you look at the rise of the abolitionist movement and, and the Republican Party, it literally goes from being a sort of uh, fringe idea in the late 1840s to a major idea by the early 1850s, to the best-selling novel of the 19th century, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin in the 1850s, which is also then becomes a widely seen play, to the breakdown of the Whig Party, the creation of the Republican Party, and the election of the first Republican president in a six-year period. That's how fast things can change when, in fact, you have uh, people beginning to make their minds up. The way that has to happen, I think, at an intellectual level, is you've got to go back to the model we've used before of vision, strategies, projects, and tactics in order to replace the culture of poverty and violence with a culture of productivity and safety. Now, that is, you've got to think through what's our vision of replacement, what are our strategies for replacement, what are the projects we think will work for replacement, and then what do we do every day to make that happen. However, when you think you know what you're doing, and you think you have thought this through, then you have to go out and practice, listen, learn, help, and lead in order to check out the ideas. I mean, just because you think it's smart doesn't mean it's smart. It means you think it's smart. Now you've got to go test it out with lots of other human beings. And in particular, I would argue, we should listen to experts, experienced practitioners, and the poor themselves in order to test out the ideas of replacement. And I would argue this process should be ongoing and should lead to Deming's concept of continuous improvement, that every day we're going to be trying to do slightly better. Now, notice the three groups I listed. Experts, that is, people who study it. Experienced practitioners, that is, people who are living it. So at one level you say, who are the best five college professors in America who study um, missionary efforts among the poor? But then it's pretty useful to go out and find five or ten people who are missionary efforts among the poor. Because it may well be, as you listen to the actual practitioner, that their experience is more complicated and more human and has a different quality to it. It's like talking to a football quarterback versus reading the Sports Illustrated version. Or talking to a gourmet chef and reading a good cookbook. Then, frankly, you need to sit down and listen to the poor for a while. Now, the poor are not definitive by definition because the poor are trapped in this culture. And you're trying to describe a culture they by definition don't, aren't in. So they can't by themselves tell you that's right or wrong, but they can raise a ton of questions and they can tell you what doesn't seem right about it. And they can force you to keep thinking through your model. Because remember, you're outside this world by definition. You, uh, now, one or two of you may have grown up in it, uh, and, and may well have grown out of it, in which case you have a very useful ability to help. Although even there you've got to be very cautious because sometimes the person who had the unique personal strength to rise doesn't quite understand why their brothers and sisters and cousins didn't make it. So there's no, this is not a simple thing. I'm going back to what I said a while ago. This is very hard. We have failed at it because we keep trying to reduce it to a level of simplicity that will make it easy. It isn't, and it won't be. And, and on that note, how come the uh, former poor aren't listed in that list of people that we should listen to, people that have actually climbed out of the system? For the, for the very reason I just gave, because, because unless, unless they are in some way actively engaged in helping the poor, they may have learned exactly the wrong lessons because they're learning lessons about very strong personalities. I mean, when you talk, for example, to somebody who says, well, I used to be an alcoholic, but I woke up one morning and I quit. Any of you have ever been smokers? who talked to somebody who said, well, you just quit. <laughs> that person has a unique, useful experience, but it may not be very relevant to a more normal person for whom, the, you know, to, for whom breaking an addiction or breaking alcoholism or breaking the habits of poverty and violence is a more formidable and more frightening challenge. So they're useful to listen to. Yeah, I would argue that the unique experience is that of the person who broke out, who's made, who, who has developed a whole new set. Maybe. Okay. No, 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 just saying to you, that person may be helpful. I'm not against all of them. I, I would suggest to you that they probably come under practitioners because they've actually made it up. But I, but I wouldn't automatically accept their view because they may have such unique personal strengths. It's worth listening to them. And it's worth saying, now, how did it happen to you? And what did you do? And, I, and I'm, all, I'm for that. I work with a lot of people who fit that category. But I wouldn't just accept them because they very often are very strong personalities. They're very smart. They, have lot, they may have had the one unique relative who helped them. Okay? 
What you're trying to also figure out is, what about the ones who aren't as smart? Or they don't have strong habits, or they didn't have an aunt who raised them? Like Arnold Schwarzenegger is, can literally do anything in the world. He, he, I mean, he, has, he has an amazing power of concentration. It doesn't mean everybody can come over from Austria, win a physique contest, and, and take over Hollywood. Right. But I would argue that I would argue that not all people that climb out of poverty have those unique traits. Sometimes all it takes is just integrity. I mean, it doesn't no. take anything. No. Yeah, but that's right. Like, okay, I'm not, not going to argue with you very long. But individuals can go from here to here because they're individuals. And America is a country where this happens every morning. And and by the way, it also goes the reverse. I mean, one of the things that's fascinating to study in America is people slide out of success into having no money on a regular basis. I mean, this is a country where people go bankrupt routinely. So you have people, you, you, in any generation, you have some people who rise and some people who fall and so forth. That's, what you're trying to do here, though, is walk into a community and take 20,000 people in downtown Atlanta and figure out under what circumstances will we help them one by one move. Now, it's useful to talk to people who've done it. And I think it's also particularly useful to bring them back here I mean, one of the great tragedies, frankly, is that when very successful people leave, leave the inner city, they won't go back. It's a very real problem of getting to come back in and, and having them be witnesses who say, look, I made it. You can make it too. That's helpful. But they may not fully understand the complexity of helping a person who is weaker than they are, has less willpower than they, they do, and isn't just purely as intelligent. Uh, in terms of, of making that, it, it, it wouldn't hurt to add them in here, but, but don't overstate the ability of somebody like that in and of themselves to do it. Uh, they're very helpful as witnesses more than they are, I think, automatically as analysts. Let me also suggest to you that, that the vision that we want to establish is that every American is endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This will seem obvious to you until you take seriously every American. But if, you, if we actually mean that sentence as our vision, it then has a second sentence. We owe it to every American citizen to involve them in a culture and a system which ensures their God-given rights and responsibilities as full citizens. Now again, the key here is every American. We all sort of say it. Well, of course that's true. Ah, but are we determined to are we really determined to live it out? Are we really determined to say every child born in 1995 should absolutely grow up in that kind of framework? That's a big order. Now, I think it leads you to, to three really simple principles that are the visionary principles. Every citizen is an American, every neighborhood is part of America, and every child is an American child. But the minute you accept that, then you have to say to yourself, wow, this is a big challenge. And you can't avoid it. Because every time a child dies for lack of prenatal care, or a child gets killed in a drive-by shooting, or a child ends up in a room where they're not going to learn anything, we have failed in our vision level commitment that every American has the right to pursue happiness. 